the show here. Get it on the big screen, hopefully. There we go. <clears throat> Get anybody it's full size. Um, so I am uh, Jeff Walls. I am a wildlife tech at Horicon Marsh Wildlife um, at the at the center there, the uh, Horicon Marsh Education and Visitor Center. I'm also president of the Horicon Marsh Bird Club. So I have a bunch of experience working with birds, mainly just uh, as a birding enthusiast. I like to call myself a birding ambassador, um, connecting people and birds. So um, today I'm going to explain and tell you a little bit about uh, the, the wonderful place that we have at Horicon. So um, title of my program is Birding Horicon, Horicon Marsh. You won't egret it. <clears throat> so Horicon is uh, located about an hour north of Madison, northeast of Madison. It's in north central Dodge County. A little bit of it, it spills over into Fond du Lac, but not a lot. And so I'm going to go a little bit quickly um, on the background of Horicon, how it got to be, you know, what it's about. So uh, Horicon Marsh was formed about 10 to 12,000 years ago when the last uh, um, glaciers receded and has had about uh, 12,000 years of human history. Um, there were pre-European settlement. There was a lot of uh, Indian um, Native American uh, villages uh, surrounding Marsh. Um, it was uh, Horicon um, in the native lang language was uh, known as a gathering place. So there was abundant uh, fish and game there. It was also uh, known for its wild rice. So that was pre-European settlement in damming and ditching. The wild rice was was probably one of the um, most dominant vegetation features of Horicon. Uh, European settlement uh, happened uh, in the early 1840s. First bunch of settlers uh, came in there. And uh, in 1845, a dam was built at the uh, outlet of the marsh and powered the first saw sawmill. Uh, 1846, the dam was enlarged and created a vast lake providing uh, commerce and also shipping. But the key, feet, the key quote here is, uh, but it also flooded some of the surrounding farmland and led to disputes with landowners. <clears throat> so at the time that Lake Horicon uh, was in existence, it was billed as the world's largest artificial lake. Um, at one time, uh, there were five steamboats that operated on the lake. Um, they went from such exotic locations as Burnett, uh, Chester Landing, Kikoski, and uh, all the way up the uh, East Branch up to Mayville, of course, Horicon, Burnett, so they served a, a lot of the surrounding communities. Um, they transported lumber, um, sometimes uh, coal, sometimes uh, grains, and uh, various, even some, some passengers, uh, various commerce on, on the lake. So as I said before, the uh, um, dispute with the surrounding landowners happened because their land was flooded out. The dam um, flooded out their land. They filed suit in the state Supreme Court and, and uh, won. And so rather than pay off each individual farmer, it was much cheaper for the owners of the dam just to remove the dam. And in 1869, the dam was removed and uh, slowly reverted back to its original uh, state. So back in about the 1870s to 1900, um, resulted in the return of a great waterfall habitat. 
So at one time there were six private hunting clubs on uh, Horicon Marsh. And uh, some of the members came from uh, um, a few of the local members, but some were from, from Milwaukee, some from Chicago, and even a few as far from uh, away as New York City. So if you uh, remember this, this period in our history and conservation history, um, that time period was a, the part of the great harvest or great slaughter. Uh, at that time, there were no um, fish and game regulations. You could take as many, uh, harvest as many uh, ducks, geese, swans, anything um, that you wanted um, any time of the year using any method. So it was, it was the great market hunting days, um, which really, well, which we know now, which really decimated the, a lot of our waterfall and a lot of our just our wildlife populations in general. We nearly exterminated a lot of uh, species. Uh, so within about 25 years, um, most of the ducks uh, were gone. So the unrestrictive, unregulated hunting um, decimated that whole population. So from about 19. 10 to 1916, the idea was, well, if, if the duck populations were gone, what are we going to do with it? Um, so they tried to ditch and drain it for agricultural use. So it took them six years with this uh, dredge and barge uh, to um, try to ditch it. So those scars are still visible today at, at, uh, on the marsh, a main ditch and some of the lateral ditches uh, used to try to um, dewater the uh, the marsh. So their uh, uh, great plan was to grow root vegetables, carrots, potatoes, and onions. Um, but that project failed within about 18 months and the whole thing went bankrupt. So after that, it was a true wasteland. So the, uh, the abandoned farmland, um, the peat soil, organic peat soil, um, exposed to air and it started to burn, spontaneously combust. So from 1920 to about 1932, um, it was a, a wasteland. And that wasn't just uh, true for Horicon, but it was true for a lot of um, South Central Wisconsin where some of those, those great marshes had been um, tried to drain. So then the, Early 1920s or 1930s, there was a group uh, formed to try to restore Horicon Marsh, led by uh, Curly Radke. <clears throat> and um, he was uh, uh, rallied the uh, Wisconsin legislature and actually brought them out, put them on a pontoon boat and set them up uh, part of the, the main ditch in 1927 to try to get the uh, legislature to do uh, get funding for the Horican Marsh restoration. Um, that project, uh, he was able to convince the Wisconsin legislature. Um, they started uh, with uh, putting a dam back in at Horicon and uh, they're um, starting to reflood it. But as they were buying up the surrounding farmland and trying to create the Horican Marsh, uh, they quickly realized that they were vastly underfunded and, and vastly overwhelmed um, um, by the scale of, of the project. So the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service was brought in at the time, and they uh, came up with an agreement that the Fish and Wildlife Service would restore the northern two-thirds of the marsh, and the southern one-third of the marsh uh, would be restored by the, the state. So that's why we have two separate entities that, that manage, uh, own and manage the Horican Marsh. So fast forward to present day now, um, the restoration was, was uh, pretty successful. Um, it's not quite as diverse as it was pre-European settlement and pre-ditching and, and farming, but it's, it's still a pretty good uh, area. So now it's known as a, <clears throat> um, a globally important bird area. It's also a wetland of international importance uh, under the Ramsar Convention. Um, here you can see some of the Ramsar uh, wetland sites in, in the US. 
Um, there's been a few more added since then, but you can see it's it's a it's a pretty prestigious um, thing to have in your right here in your backyard. Horicon gets a lot of visitors uh, during the year. Uh, they figure there's about a uh, 550,000 that, that come through Horicon. Um, they come through, sometimes they stop and sometimes they don't. So, or they just uh, um, travel the periphery of the marsh. So that's where um, I come in, some of my educators come in, we like to get you into the marsh, experience it um, and uh, get to visit it from uh, from the inside. Um, <clears throat> so some of those, uh, remember back in the late 50s and early 60s, once uh, the marsh was restored, we started to get these vast numbers of Canada geese that, that came in. Up to uh, a, a half a million came in at, at, a, at a time and the skies were just filled um, at Horicon. So this is uh, Highway 49 on a, probably a, a fall afternoon, um, the numbers of, of tourists were just immense and it would kind of overwhelm the, the whole uh, area. So this is a famous picture by uh, taken along Highway 49 by um, a local photographer from, from Mayville. So fast forward to, to present times. <clears throat> so here's uh, what the, Horican Marsh looks like right now. Uh, you can see the northern uh, two thirds is owned and managed by the uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service. The southern one third is managed, owned and managed by the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. It's operated as a state wildlife area, which means there's hunting, fishing, trapping, um, wildlife observation, cross country skiing um, is allowed. The northern two thirds that's uh, owned by the Department of Interior, run by the Fish and Wildlife Service, is operated as a waterfall refuge. So it means there's no waterfall hunting there. Um, access is, is somewhat restricted. No boating is allowed on, um, the, on the refuge part. Um, and you need to stick to designated trails uh, during most of the year. So that's just some of the um, differences there are um, between the federal northern two-thirds and the, the state in southern one-third. So I'm going to take you on a, uh, a virtual tour and this uh, I put together years ago before there was virtual. <laughs> so uh, this is at the end of the Palmatory Street. This is coming out of City Horicon. This is the end of Palmatory Street called Palmatory Hill Observation Area. Uh, this is looking north and northeast. Um, this is looking uh, north and northwest. And this is, uh, so we go out of town a little bit. And this is uh, our Horgan Marsh Education and Visitor Center. It's about a dozen years old now. Um, this is the uh, prairie the, that I help manage there. Um, so it's surrounded by a couple of uh, prairie restorations. Um, has this tremendous view. This is from the inside the center. Um, spotting scopes there. Um, the education center right now is closed uh, due to COVID. Um, hopefully by summer, fall, um, the building will be back open again. Um, I don't make those decisions, so um, just stay tuned and, and uh, um, you know, watch out for when it reopens. But um, great view. The hiking trails uh, are open, uh, just the building is closed. So you can come and visit, um, you know, hike around, uh, do all the bird watching stuff, but the, the, the building and the educational programs um, aren't uh, going on right now. So just a couple of the birds, uh, when we go to each one of our stops here, um, some that we, you may see in that area. So this is uh, American White Pelican, uh, one of the kind of a, a recent uh, visitor to the marsh, and I'm talking recent, you know, probably in the last 25 years or so um, that uh, they're here now. Uh, they nest here. Um, they were kind of blown off course uh, years ago. Um, 
about the right around the year 2000 when they first started to show up within a couple of years they st stayed at Horicon and and bred there it started with like 25 30 pair they're really uh, skittish they really like isolated uh, wetlands um, and they're really susceptible to disturbance on their breeding grounds so now um, they've kind of taken not taken over but they've, they've expanded their range um, there's some nesting that goes on uh, various parts of, of Dodge County um, I'm sure you probably even see them in Dean County once in a while as, as well so so this is what uh, uh, at the state end um, the visitor center down here um, located in the southeast part of the, on the marsh you can see there's about uh, five miles where the hiking trails around here the dnr uh, ed center uh intermediate island hiking all the way around the, the bach huber impoundment you can hike over to uh, the palmas tory street overlook um, there's a, a couple of uh, forest edges there um, mainly a lot of uh, marshland habitat you, you're walking on, on top of the dikes there so uh, one of the birds you could see during the, the spring uh, when the warblers come back is uh, this Wilson's warblers. Um, they really like uh, willows is kind of what their uh, niche is in, um, in their feeding habitats. Although this one here is in a, looks like a, a red oak. Um, great blue herons, of course, uh, one of our signature birds that we, we get at Horicon. There is a rookery um, out at Four Mile Island that you can uh, view uh, through a spotting scope or through the big binoculars at the education center there um, and see the great blue herons out on the uh, platforms out on the rookery. <clears throat> so our next stop in our little virtual tour is gonna go up to uh, the kind of imaginary boundary between the state and federal ends. Um, this is Main Dyke Road. So the Main Dyke, separates the north end and south end of federal and estate properties. Um, you can drive out uh, about halfway out. Um, it's a one-way road. So there's there's a upper level and lower level. Going out, you're on the upper level. And when you come back, uh, you're on the lower level. So you can drive about halfway out. Um, you can walk, hike, or bike the whole thing all year round. So Dyke Road is about six and a quarter miles long. There is a parking lot on the west side just off of Highway 26 <clears throat> that you can park there and you can hike and bike as far as you want all the way across um, and, and return on Dyke Road. So the greedy, great egret, Another one bird that you may see along the your hiking spots along Main Dyke Road. But one of our birds that we're known for here is the American bittern, a uh, very secretive marsh bird. Um, normally, your encounters are going to be hearing their their odd gulping and burping like uh, call. Uh, generally mornings, evenings, and, and at night. Um, if you get to see one flying, you consider yourself pretty lucky. And if you get to see one out in the open, uh, such as this one, you consider yourself very, very lucky. I would say probably less than 10% of your encounters are going to be um, like this wonderful view that you, we have here. Another one of our birds uh, is uh, Virginia rail. And this one here is a small secretive uh, rail. They generally, there again, um, you're not gonna see them uh, very much. Uh, you're generally gonna hear them. Um, if you get to see one out in the open, consider yourself fortunate, but you'll, you'll hear them quite a bit. Uh, one of our other Martian birds is a Sora. So, the difference between the Sora and the Virginia rail, you're going to notice that that Sora almost has like a, a, a bill made out of a, a, a piece of corn. So you look for that yellow bill. 
Uh, let's see if I can get to, get this to play. So that's the call of the uh, the Sora. So Dyke Road um, is kind of special uh, all year round. And this was taken probably late November, early December uh, before it froze up for the year. Um, during the winter time, we can get uh, snowy owls to visit. And this had to be, let's say, very early November, very early December. It hadn't froze yet. So this was a year that uh, snowy owls came down in, in pretty good force, and we were able to, to find some out on Dyke Road. They weren't that far away uh, from the road there. And they'll hang around to about mid to late March. I think most of them are gone, um, although I have spotted them as late as uh, Earth Day weekend. But um, don't count on being around that late. So as you go into the entrance of Dyke Road, it um, has great grassland birding. Um, there are several hundred acres of, of grasslands like there. So grassland birds would be typically uh, bobolinks, um, sedgerens, um, dixisles that come a little bit later, clay-colored sparrows, um, the northern harriers, um, American woodcock, are some of the birds that you would see there. Just south of the main dike road is uh, um, you're going back into the southern portion there of the state end, um, northern road. So that road runs between some, some wooded uplands and the east branch of the Rock River. Tremendous spot in early spring for um, migration for uh, warblers and other birds there. Um, here's a Nashville warbler that would be typical of what you would see along there. Um, here's a, a black and white warbler. So let's go further north on the east side and you'll run into the Horican National Wildlife uh, Center, the official office and visitor center there where the headquarters is at for the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, this is the interior. Um, this is their visitor center there. Um, that is also closed right now. I have no idea exactly when they're looking at uh, reopening again. But uh, there again, uh, the center is closed, but their trails in, um, are all open as well. Um, one of the more recent additions there, um, they put in about three or four years ago. It's a natural playground for, for kids and also has a, a sense of wonder trail. It's about a, a boardwalk that's maybe a quarter mile long that uh, terminates in a, in a nice uh, shallow water pond. I know they've, they've had a lot of uh, turns and egrets um, using that pond. I think uh, trumpeter swans nested in there a couple of years ago. So um, it's shorter, you know, it's flat um, with this, this playground and everything. It's made for kids, you know, so it's not uh, a big slog that you, you know, kids would get tired at. There's a little uh, patch of forest there with some tremendous uh, um, uh, forest plants in, in there as well. So kids, uh, that's, that'd be a, a great spot to check out. Go a, bit, uh, a little bit further north uh, ledge road so ledge road kind of terminates in the interior of the marsh it goes right up to um, the main ditch so you drive in there you get uh, water on your north side and then woods on your south side so you get a, a this collection or a median of habitats you can have some some great uh, uh, birds along there so some that would be uh, typically what you could see along would be there would be uh, green herons, um, pied-billed grebes uh, there. Just a little bit north of that is the Budcook hiking area, and that's a big grassland area as well. Um, there again, um, bobolinks, 
um, dick thistles, sedge wrens, clay colored sparrows, uh, your grassland specialties. You uh, may get to see a northern harrier cruise by. Um, lots of cool stuff there. Lots of uh, uh, there, it's about two and a half miles uh, worth of hiking trail there again. Uh, some things you could see maybe this time of year, or if you get lucky in the fall as well, you can catch a short-eared owl there, one of our, our grassland species. Um, this particular area, it's it's set up on, on top of the hill, has a tremendous view um, east of you, excuse me, west west of you, um, and it, it's known for great uh, sunsets up there. It's also known um, for the local weather photographers, for those folks that like to uh, watch incoming storms. It's a great place. Uh, it's about six miles across there where there's no light. Uh, you'll maybe see a, a, a little bit of light from the city of Waupon, but it's a, one of the darker skies uh, areas in the county. So it's a great place to, to watch sunsets there. So we get out to... Highway 49, which is kind of the, the very northern edge of, of the marsh. Um, as you know, it's a state highway. So uh, if you're out there, it does have good birds, but if, if you're out there, uh, be careful. Uh, lots of traffic, but there's also a lot of, a lot of good birds that have been spotted along Highway 49. So some of the great birds that were spotted there, this was about 10 years ago. Um, we don't normally get ibis in the state of Wisconsin, only generally just in the spring for, you know, we get a rarity here and there. Um, this was the first time that we, we've had two species of horicon, uh, two species of ibis ever in the state of Wisconsin. And this was the first photo of a glossy, which is on the left-hand side, and the white-faced ibis, which is on the right-hand side ever taken um, together in the state of Wisconsin. So I had that record for about 24 hours and then, um, you know, word got out and then everybody had a photo of glossy and white faced ibises together. So um, pretty cool. You, you can see them uh, uh, there side by side. Their ranges don't normally overlap. Um, the white faced ibis are, are west coast bird and the glossy ibises are east coast bird. And so I always say we're in the middle of ibis no man's land. So um, we were blessed that year to have both. Uh, one of the normal favorites you, you probably will see there uh, are ruddy ducks. This really kind of odd looking duck, uh, bright blue bill, rusty, ruddish back. And if you're very lucky, um, there is a reintroduction of the whooping cranes uh, at Horicon. So keep your eyes peeled. Um, certain areas are some are better than others, but uh, you know, search the um, surrounding marshes and some of the uplands around there, you may actually see a whooping crane. Uh, whooping cranes are one of the most endangered um, birds on the planet for a while. Um, we've made progress. They're still very endangered. I think there's probably less than four to 500 in the wild. Um, there's probably that many in captivity to help with the reintroductions in, in captive breeding um, programs. But at once there were less than 20 of them. There's a long highway 49, um, great sunsets uh, along there as well. Great blue heron. Um, wonderful bird, one of our signature birds uh, there. You'll probably see, they're, they're back now. And once uh, they're fully back, you will see them pretty often. So up in the Northwest part, um, a lot of people uh, know this as the, uh, the auto tour, very popular area. It's a little over three and a half miles of paved uh, uh, trail, whoops, excuse me. Um, and then there's probably close to three and a half to four miles worth of uh, hiking trails around there. Um, it also has the floating boardwalk in the um, lower right-hand portion there. Uh, you'll see a floating boardwalk that's about uh, 
Ooh, let's see what it says here. Boardwalk. Oh, it's, oh 0.3. Um, so it's about a third of a mile that, that floats. Um, pretty cool. It actually gets you out into the marsh. Um, walk around, you get the sights, uh, sounds, smells of the marsh. So I was just up there um, Sunday with, uh, or Saturday it was, with, the, with grandkids. Um, you know, you could hear pie billed grebes, and the ducks were there, the geese were there. So uh, pretty cool uh, experience for the kids. Here's the uh, great, this is actually sunrise here uh, from the um, boardwalk. Was one of the birds you could possibly see there, uh, black crown night heron, another one of our uh, good marsh specialty birds. So we're going to work our way back now on the west side of the marsh, um, all the way back down on the state end. Um, places that you could visit is uh, Kaya Marsh, which in Burnett Impoundment, which is a sub impoundment of the. Um, Horicon Marsh. So this impoundment was put around there, basically dug a big ditch, mounted dirt around there. So it helps keep water levels at a different level. Um, it can be accessed off of Swan Road. Uh, it's a nice little hiking area there as well. You can walk the, the trails out there. Uh, some of the birds you can spot around there, of course, you know, the, the Forster's Terns, those will be the little white birds that kind of almost look like gulls, but they're not, not a gull. They'll have a, a split tail and they'll uh, be kind of flying around and all of a sudden they'll just dive right into the marsh and hopefully come up with a minnow or a helgramite or some type of aquatic insect. So with that, it shows here is the uh, um, Horican Marsh, the auto tour and the bike route. So the um, Horican Marsh, whoops, excuse me, um, has the wild goose trail that runs along the west side of the marsh. Um, it shows the kind of recommended driving route around the, the marsh. It's about 55 to 60 miles around um, via road. So that's uh, another way you can explore. And then on a state end, uh, we have uh, the Horton Marsh Canoe Route. It's about six and a half miles. It runs from uh, the Greenhand Landing on the east side uh, down through the heart of the marsh where you catch up with the main dike and then you take the main dike road uh, or main dike, excuse me, that comes down uh, and you end up in the, the city of Horicon there. Um, it's about six and a half miles. You can um, bike it uh, using the uh, portage. Uh, we've, we've taken and, and uh, stashed our bikes in the, the, the city there, locked them up, um, took our car, dropped off the uh, canoes, paddled down through, uh, met up with our bikes, uh, and then uh, took the bike trail up over to back the Greenhead, which is about about four or five miles. Um, very nice uh, um, area to bike. So um, that's one option you can do as well. Some things you can see uh, when you run so you're the interior. Uh, the common moorhen is always a favorite. It's going to look like a coot, but only has a red uh, candy corn colored. Uh, bill. And here's the coot. So the coot's difference is going to have that white bill. Mm, let's see. Let have a... And then along uh, the, the west end of the marsh uh, that runs basically from Clyman to the city of Fond du Lac is a wild goose trail. And it's a bike trail that runs 34 miles long. Um, through the northern half of Dodge County and into Fond du Lac County. It's a rails to trail, so it's flat. Um, it has a crushed lime surface. Um, and because it's rails to trail, it's flat. You know, there's no, no hills on it. 
And now that the, the trail has been there for ooh, since the late seventies, early eighties. So it's got a great uh, um, vegetation base. So if you're biking, it's a lot of trees on either side. So it's going to be shaded and it's going to block the wind for windy days if you want to uh, bike there. So it's a kind of like you're biking through this, this tunnel of trees. It's, it's really um, wonderful. Um, and you can run into some, some pretty good birds along the way as well. Uh, another quick spot to visit is uh, Ledge County Park. It's east of the marsh. Um, absolutely gorgeous views of Horicon. Um, it's part of the Dodge County Park System. Uh, you can camp there as well. You can use that as your headquarters if you'd like to, to visit for a weekend or, or several days. Um, 83 acres. Uh, it has this great, uh, sits on the Niagara Escarpment, this great cliff. It's about 30 uh, feet. It's a um, natural migration corridor. Uh, has uh, two miles worth of hiking trail. It has uh, nice showers and restroom facilities there. Excellent warbler spot in the springtime. Um, great place to visit there as well. So uh, just to sum it all up there, uh, Horican Marsh is about 33,000 acres, um, 17 miles of hiking trails within the marsh, uh, 24 separate impoundments that are in the marsh, 34 miles of bike trail, six miles of canoe trail. Um, and then on the state end, there's 5,000 acres worth of boatable and paddleable waters there. Uh, grasslands, forested uplands, and marsh. Um, as of to date, there have been over 300 and some species. It has 304 species of birds. Uh, they're now, I know that has increased since I've done this. Um, presently in Dodge County, I think we are up to 314. Uh, species of birds that have been spotted and documented in, in the state. I've enjoyed it for 40 plus years. And it's pretty priceless. So with that, um, I think that concludes my presentation there. Um, did we... I'll take any questions or do we have any questions in uh, the chat at all or any questions that, that came up if you'd like to. Good, sure. Um, hope to, do, to see you out there. If you have any questions, now is the time to ask. Is Horican Marsh related to Ding Darling on Sanibel Island? In a way, it is um, because it's part of the federal wildlife refuge system. Um, Ding Darling, and, and uh, who I think is one of the first refuges. Um, that happened. Horican Marsh came uh, later. Um, so right now, um, the boat trips are not available. Um, the folks that ran the, the boat tour business uh, retired. Um, that business is for sale. So if somebody's looking for um, it's a, a great way to uh, a tourist, eco-tourist business uh, be a great way. It's a, a built-in uh, turnkey business there. Um, hopefully we'll be able to do some type of uh, birding hikes there uh, again soon. We don't know when that'll be happening. Um, we normally have a uh, bird festival every year as well. This year it's going to be much scaled back. We are going to have a few um, outdoor led hikes. Um, look for that coming up 
soon um, on the Horik and Marsh Bird Club website. Okay, question. Janet Miller says, uh, or asked the question, um, whooping cranes nest you there? Yes, they are. So uh, last year um, was the first time we had um, a nesting whooping cranes that actually fledged. Um, so we're looking forward to that um, as well. Okay, are leash dogs allowed in the state in uh, national section? Leash dogs are allowed, but they are very strict on, uh, on the leash part. Um, I've known the refuge does give tickets for dogs not on leash. Um, pick after your pick up after your dogs as well, and um, uh, there are disposal sites uh, for those. Uh, little gems that you pick up so um, as well um, dogs are not allowed off leash um, on the refuge at any time except for during uh, hunting seasons so mm. yeah um comment here are uh, good I'm looking for a place that will not run into off-leash dogs um, so yes the, we enforce that very very much so mm, great somebody uh, angel um, said they saw some some whooping cranes <clears throat> um, the campground at uh, Ledge Park, yes, um, well, I shouldn't say that. It, it may be soon. So so check out the Dodge County website. Um, I normally know they open up the end of April. They may not quite be ready yet, but uh, check out the Dodge County um, Parks website for that. You can reserve all that stuff right online. Um, Ledge Park has a, has a nice shower facility, bathrooms, uh, good playground area, a uh, bunch of hiking facilities. Uh, like I said, it's a, it's a gorgeous view. Uh, Virginia says, what's, asked, uh, what's the best area to bird in afternoons? So birding in the afternoons, you want to be looking to the east. So you have the sun on your back. Um, evenings, uh, once the dike road opens up, and then, this is this is normal. They, they keep dike road closed until it um, dries out quite a bit. So the, the goal is every year is to have it opening dur during our bird festival, which is Mother's Day weekend. Um, so that's a great place to drive real slow in the evenings. Um, you'll get to see, hopefully, you know, possibly hear and see your bitterns, your egrets, your Virginia rails, your herons, you know, all those kind of um, areas there. Uh, if you're looking for perching birds, yeah, uh, try to have the sun at your, at your back. So just a little hint there, if you're, uh, Go to Ledge Park, you want to bird the lower ledge park in the afternoons and then the upper ledge um, in the mornings. So you're not looking into the sun. Uh, Yellow-headed uh, question, Janet Miller asks, uh, are yellow-headed blackbirds still in residence? Uh, yes, they are. Um, I was up there, say Saturday, Sunday, Saturday it was. Uh, we did not any see any back yet, but I know they're back in the area. Uh, I saw some photos of some uh, along the Rock River just south of Houstonsford, which is just south on the marsh by maybe a dozen miles. So there may be a few back. I suspect uh, with, with each south wind, we're going to have more and more of them come back. So um, just the insider hint there a little bit. 
um, the yellow-headed blackbirds come to the feeders at Marsh Haven Nature Center, which is a private nature center on the north end of the marsh. Um, so if you're looking specifically for those, you check that place out. I think it's like a $3 daily visitor, uh, $35 annual um, um, admission fee. So they are in the area, beautiful birds. Anybody want to ask any uh, other questions? Um, you can unmute yourself and ask them uh, there. Did I uh, let's see? Hopefully. Okay. Um, they say the commercial boat rides is, is not running right now. I'm taking questions off the chat. Um, the commercial boat rides are not running right now. They, uh, like I said, the um, company re uh, folks retired. Um, business is for sale. So if you're looking for a great ecotourism business to get into, uh, check that out. Um, so Leash Dogs, we covered that. Um, Leash dogs, trails only. Um, leash den, pick up after your, your dogs as well. Um, whooping cranes on the marsh, yes, they are um, gorgeous. So hopefully this year we'll, we'll have some more. I know there are some in the area. Um, hopefully that reintroduction will go well. I know uh, they've had success at Mesita and White River. So uh, I know at one time last year, we had like a dozen uh, young colts, which is uh, colts are the term for young cranes. Um, so we had up to a dozen colts uh, last year, late summer. So I don't know if all of them made it, made it through migration or not, but. I think we've covered most of the questions and I, I want to say thank you so much for this presentation. It was informative and I, for one, am definitely looking forward to making a visit there. Well, good. Um, that's, that's my, my goal is, uh, is to inspire and then open your eyes to birds. It's kind of like I always say, you, you buy a new car and then all of a sudden like, oh, you start to see that type of car all over now. So now that you know I've opened your eyes to birds, I hope to hope you get to see more of them and, and, and realize where they where they are and where they've been and, and protect those places and, and take care of them. Excellent. So I'll uh, I'll wrap this up, but thank you again, Jeff, and thank you everyone for coming. Have a good afternoon.